Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about something extremely important, which is what's our model of a quantum computer and what makes it all really work at, at some fundamental level. So here's what our model looks like. So here's our set of qubits. And our model is that we have some classical computer which is attached to, you know, a laser or, you know, some equipment. And this classical computer is what issues the commands which says apply gate U1 and then apply U2 and then so on, apply U sub T. Okay, so it, what we basically have is, you know, this is a model for a quantum computer is a set of qubits which, which, are, being, which are being controlled through an external classical computer. Okay, so, so let's look at what, what our goals are in all this. So, so goal number one is we are trying to control our qubits externally by, by some external means through some, in, so, so we are interacting with the qubits from the outside. And this gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we actually implement our quantum computer in the sense that we can decide what sequence of gates we are going to perform. So this is, this classical computer then represents the programming of the quantum computer. This is, this is really convenient. This is what makes it all really feasible. But then, this seems to contradict goal number two, which is to isolate our qubits this kind of in inadvertent measurement of the of our quantum system is called decoherence. So decoherence is when, you know, or environmental, it's when, when our environment inadvertently measures the measures our qubits. But now this is something that happens all the time. This is, this is really the biggest impediment to implementing a quantum computer, is decoherence. And so, so we have a basic contradiction here. On the one hand, we want to be able to control our qubits from the outside. But when we control our qubits from the outside, we actually have to have our qubits interact with the external world. But then the question is, how can we interact with our qubits without actually measuring them? Okay, so let me let me try to illustrate this. Let's let's just look at how this comes about. So let's say that this is what our quantum computer looks like, and you know this is one of the qubits in our quantum computer. And let's say it's in the state alpha zero plus beta one. And let's say that this is our environment. And for our purposes, let's say it's a single qubit. And let's say that, that this qubit in our quantum computer, at some point, it, it, actually, it actually interacts with the environment via the C0 gate. And let's say that this qubit then, it's, in, it's part of the environment, it just gets lost, the environment is big, so it never again interacts with, with our quantum computer, with the qubits in our quantum computer. Much later, we measure the output of this quantum computer. At that point, let's say we also, you know, this, this qubit also gets measured, the environmental qubit also gets measured. Now, what's the effect of all this? Well, Remember, we have this principle that we have, that has come up before, the principle of deferred measurement. What it says is the following, that if you have a qubit which, which never again, you know, which, which is measured at some point in time, but it hasn't interacted with the rest of your qubits for a long time, then you can actually take this measurement and you can move it back. Right? So as long as this qubit is, is you know, this, this environmental qubit is not interacting with the rest of your qubits in the system, it doesn't matter whether you measure it at 
do the measurement at this point or you do the measurement later. It's all the same. So let's say we move the measurement back to this point. Now what happens? Well, of course, you see outcome 0 with probability alpha squared and 1 with probability beta squared. But of course, if you have outcome 0 here on this environmental qubit because of the C0 gate, you know that, that your, your, your qubit in your computer is also projected into the state 0. And so this superposition on your qubit state collapses. Okay, so, so this is why any interaction with the environment, you may as well regard it as a measurement. Okay, so, so now that's the backdrop which makes it, you know, which makes it so hard to believe that goals one and two can be simultaneously realized. But in fact, that's exactly what's the basis of, you know, these designs of quantum computers as a classical computer which controls your set of qubits. So let's see how this, this is actually carried out. What's the, what are the principles behind it? Okay, so, so let, let, me, let me make this a little more concrete. So let's say you have a spin qubit, which is in the state alpha up plus beta down. And now you perform, let's say, you want to perform a bit flip on it. Okay, so so now you want it to be in the state alpha down plus beta up, which means that what you would like is for your up spin up state to go to a spin down state. Well, because of the energy difference between the spin up and the spin down state, it turns out that in order to go from the spin up to the spin down state, your system must emit a photon. And similarly, to go from the spin down to the spin up state, there must be an absorption of a photon. But now, you'd imagine that this should mean that it's as though the spin state was measured. So why is that? Well, you see, what we're going to do is, remember, in order to, in order to actually carry out this, this, this bit flip, we, we were planning to actually use some sort of linearly polarized field where, and, you know, let's say that that, that, that field contained k photons. And now we are in one of two, two cases. So either a photon got in, emitted or it got absorbed. So, so either we ended up with k plus one photons or we ended up with k minus 1 photons. And of course, we can tell the difference in principle. And so, just by knowing the state of our environment, we can tell whether we, are, we, we, we were in this part of the superposition or in this part of the superposition. But that constitutes a measurement, right? So, so that means in the process of trying to, trying to control the qubit and perform a bit flip, we've actually ended up measuring the qubit. And that's not good. Okay, so what's the answer to all this? Well, the answer is actually very beautiful and very interesting. So it turns out that, that this, you know, if you, if you for, for instance, if you're using a laser, your, your state of, of your, you know, of your laser looks, looks really like this. It's, um, you know, it, it looks like a superposition sum over k of alpha k k. So it has k photons, where, but, but it's in a superposition of k photons. So, so if we plot k versus alpha sub k, then it's some sort of a Gaussian superposition. Okay. And so, so this is our, this is the state of our field as, you know, as we are that, 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 we are, that we are applying to the single qubit. Now, what's the, what's the result of, of, of doing this? Well, either a photon is emitted or it's, or it's absorbed. In, in one of the two cases, so what happens? You get summation over k, alpha k, and now k plus 1, because one photon get, got added. And in the other case, you get summation alpha sub k, k minus 1. 
Okay, so what's the result of this? So, so in the one case, what happens is that this Gaussian shifts left. So it shifts over to the left by, by one position. In the other case, what happens is that this Gaussian shifts right by one position. But in either case, because the, the width of this Gaussian w, the width is large, well, you don't really notice this shift of 1 in this Gaussian. So in other words, what I'm saying is the probability that you can distinguish the blue curve, the blue superposition from the red superposition is, is really of the order of 1 over the width of the Gaussian. And because the width is very large, it's, you know, it's some huge power of, you know, it's some huge order of magnitude. So what this says is that really you have almost no trace in your environment of whether, whether a single photon was emitted or absorbed by your qubit. And this is why it's possible to actually carry out this kind of classical control of your quantum system in order to implement a quantum computer.